Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Utah League of Cities and Towns Annual Conference and this workshop, Ethical Leadership for City, uh, City Officials. My name is John Park. I'm with the Utah League, of, I'm with the League and uh, I'd like to start out today by introducing Reese DeMille of Republic Services. Republic Services is our sponsor today and Reese is a great friend of mine. He's the, he's the manager of municipal services in the state of Utah. So Reese, tell us a little bit about Republic Services. Thank you, John. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for allowing us, uh, Republic, to sponsor this workshop. It's, um, I wish we were doing this live, obviously, and I could be in front of you and shaking your hands and personally, but this weird time frame, we'll do the best we can with this. Republic Services in itself is in 41 states. Uh, I, I, right off the bat, I just want to kind of talk about our name, Republic Services. A lot of people still call us Allied Waste, and you may see an Allied Waste truck or a can around there. That's just because we did not elect uh, many years ago. We've been Republic Services for about 13, 14 years now. We were Allied Waste before that. We were, and almost all of our Allied Waste trucks are now gone, but we were BFI before that and Laid Law before that. But uh, the personnel pretty much all stayed the same. But we've been Republic Services here in Utah and throughout the country, again, in 41 states for about 13, 14 years. Uh, we have approximately 14 million customers. We've got 36,000 employees. We're headquartered out of Phoenix, Arizona. But one of the main reasons why I love being with Republic, and I've been here for 17 and a half years, is the fact that although we're a company based out of Phoenix, they let us kind of run the show locally. And because we're in Utah, and we're not in one of these big, big metropolitan areas like LA um, or Phoenix, that type of thing. Uh, they kind of, I don't want to say forget about us, but they let us do our thing here locally. And that's uh, been a great blessing for us. Here in the state of Utah, we have 21 contracts, residential municipal contracts from counties to cities that are from about $90,000 a year up to uh, several million dollars a year. So we can handle all services, uh, be it residential, and then also tie in commercial and industrial um, collection services as well. Obviously, uh, we don't have a materials recovery facility in the state of Utah that we own or run, but we do have the biggest one west of the Mississippi in Las Vegas, and we actually take all of our Washington County rec curbside recycling to Las Vegas. So thank you so much. Just want to share a little bit about Republic uh, to my partners out there who use Republic. Uh, thank you very much. To those who don't, would love to have the opportunity to talk to you about what we might be able to provide you and assist you with in the future. And John, it's great to see you as always. And Aaron, good luck. And I'm, if it's all right, I'm going to sit and listen for the next hour and 15 minutes uh, while you do your thing. Thanks a lot, everybody. Okay, thank you, Reese, and thanks for Republic Services. They've been a great uh, sponsor of uh, many events for municipalities and for the League of Cities and Towns. Uh, before I introduce our instructor today, uh, I want to remind you that uh, if you need to ask a question, just please put it in the chat room and please ask questions. We, uh, we, will, uh, we appreciate your, your input and we want to make sure that we're going in the right direction today and we'll try to pick that up and, and, uh, and answer your question. Our instructor today, again, is a good friend of mine. What a great opportunity for me to introduce uh, Aaron Miller. Aaron is uh, is with the BYU Romney Institute of Public Management in the Marriott School of Management where he teaches business ethics, nonprofit management, and social entrepreneurship. In addition to teaching, he is an Associate Managing Director of BYU Ballard Center for Economic Self-Reliance and a Faculty Director and Co-Founder of BYU's Grant Well Program, which, is, which, gives, which more than 350 graduate students have advised over $40 million in foundation giving. He is also the co-founder of Merit Leadership, where I met Aaron, and uh, Merit Leadership provides training for developing ethical leaders throughout the world. He has twice, twice been recognized as Teacher of the Year in the Romney Institute. Prior to teaching at BYU, Aaron practiced law in areas including small business, nonprofit, taxation, and corporate governance. And most importantly, he has a lovely wife, Katie, and four boys. And so let me turn that over to Aaron. Thank you, John. It really is great to, to be here with everybody. Um, uh, let's see, can everybody hear me okay? It looks like I'm 
saying it's working. So I'm going to share a screen now uh, for my presentation as we go through. Okay, that looks like it's working. Um, I'll take just a moment to pull up the chat. I actually want to start with a little activity in the chat. Um, I think it's fun uh, and I'll kind of report back to you guys um, what I'm seeing here, but um, I think it'd be helpful for me uh, to hear from you, uh, who you are, what you do, where you're uh, joining us from, and then finally cake or pie. And so if you'll comment on, on, uh, on that, uh, the, uh, um, it gives me a chance to get to know you all a little bit better as I present. So I'll, I'll keep an eye on that as you guys are filling in um, a little bit about yourself. Um, looks like chocolate silk pie. That's a great choice, Taylor. Four people there together at Spanish Fork. It's great to see you guys. Fresh peach pie, Bill. We have a vote for cake, our first vote for cake from Nina. That's great. Well, it looks like pie is winning pretty handily so far, everybody. No, wait, now the boats for cake are starting to pile in. Oh, cheesecake, that's a weird one, right, Rick? Like, where does that really fit? <laughs> so I guess it's called cake. It doesn't quite, the, it seems more like pie. This is great. And we got people from all over the state. It's great to, to be connected with all of you. I think this is awesome. Okay, fantastic. So we're actually gonna do another little quick exercise. This one you won't write into the chat though, uh, but this is one I want you to take just a moment to think about. Um, let's see, make sure I'm on the right spot here. I want you to pretend that you've just retired and in retiring the local paper has an article that's reflecting on your career. Um, it's going to highlight, this article is going to highlight four things about you, and I'd like you to think about, maybe even take a moment to write down what you hope it says. If you think about the, your career path, and, and I realize not all of you are in the places where you started your careers. Um, I know that's especially true in city management, um, but uh, be thinking to yourselves, um, uh, you know, if, if somebody were to reflect on the entirety of your career, after it's done. So this is something I want even those of you who are at the start of your careers to be thinking about. What are the things that you hope it says about your career? And like I said, you can highlight four things. Okay, hopefully that's been enough time for you as you've been thinking about that. Um, we're gonna revisit this. So I'd like you to take your thoughts about that and, uh, and, and uh, keep them close by because we're going to discuss it later. But I actually wanna start off by telling, telling you all a story about leadership. And I, I'm actually gonna kind of tell it in two versions. So the first version is pretty simple. So I have a friend, this is a true story by the way. So I have a friend who was hiking up a hill with some of his friends. Um, they came to a pretty big switchback and they decided at this point, well, really my friend decided at this point, it made a lot more sense to uh, cut the corner and leave the path. So they, so they jumped off the path and what it meant was they had to hop over a pretty dilapidated cardboard fence, or sorry, uh, barbed wire fence. Um, so they jump over this barbed wire fence that's kind of broken down, um, cut the corner, climb the hill and then make it to the top. Now, this is a story about leadership and it's a pretty simple one, right? My friend was the one who sort of took the role upon himself to say, hey, let's do this instead of staying on the path. And so they, they, they jumped the fence and climbed the hill. Um, now let me tell you the second version of the story. It's a little more complete. 
because it's kind of a lame story just in that context. But here's here's the missing context that makes it more exciting. Um, see, my friend was actually in the Middle East at the time that this happened. And he was in a territory that had been fought over by Israel and Syria during the Six Day War. The hill that they were climbing had old Israeli bunkers at the top of it. And the area had been designed to defend against a tank attack. Um, well, what is the best way to defend against tanks? It's with landmines. What had actually happened, the full version of this story is my friend had jumped this barbed wire fence and led his, his friends through a minefield. Now, to his defense, he didn't see the sign. It wasn't actually posted nearby, it was just a barbed wire fence. But he was coming from the United States where a barbed wire fence meant, uh, you know, somebody was just fencing off their property and maybe containing some livestock. Um, that's not how it works out there. A barbed wire fence over there means something much more dangerous, but he wasn't aware of that as a leader. Now, this is a story about leadership because I want to emphasize something about my friend. This is him here. His name is Spencer. Um, what Spencer did was incredibly dangerous. Some would call it extremely reckless. He and his friends are fortunate that they weren't hurt or killed. And it was a failure in leadership. But I want to point out something. This, this failure in leadership, which is a pretty potentially hugely damaging one, was not a result of him being a bad person. He misled this group, not because he was lacking some fundamental character trait that made him a good person or a good leader. Instead, he was lacking a skill. And I want to talk about why that's so important here. You see, our careers in many ways are kind of like a trek through a wilderness. There's a lot of exploration that goes on. We find ourselves in places that we haven't been before. Um, and also like a wilderness trek in our careers, there are hidden dangers. And, and the goal of this session is to help you appreciate those hidden dangers that come in the forms of ethics. Our goal is to make you a skilled guide for other people. And really skill is kind of the key difference here. Like my friend Spencer was telling you about, he wasn't lacking some character attributes, some fundamental you know, point of being a good person or not. He was lacking some knowledge and skills that were necessary for navigating that area safely. And, and so the goal here is not to take, uh, is not to somehow turn everybody listening to this session from, from bad people or bad leaders and turn them into good leaders. That's not actually how this works in the world of ethics. Um, what this is really about is skills. And let me go into a little more about skills if I could. I, I want you to pause and reflect on what you're good at. I mean, all of you are good at something. Everybody's good at something. And I want you to stop and think about this. Um, the things that we're good at can be varied, right? It can range from sports to music to, um, to various hobbies we might have. There are certain things you might be better at at work. You might be a wizard with Excel. Um, so think about what those things might be that you're good at. Um, and if there's one that's top of mind, I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. In fact, I, so usually when I'm doing this in person, um, I try to coax or prod people to share what they're good at, but it's hard to get people to talk about what they're good at. Um, and so maybe instead, if you want to stop and think about something that, that, think about a loved one or a close friend or a coworker, think of something that someone else is good at, and maybe type some of those into the chat if you would, and I'll share some of what, uh, what shows up. So think about, feel, feel free to share something you're good at, but if you find it easier to share, share something that someone else is good at, somebody that you know or are close to. Okay, building relationships, using communication to bring people together. Those are both great, really critical actually, especially for leadership.
what else? Think about the people around you. Think about the people you're close to. What are the things they're good at? Does anybody know anybody who just who can just crush a golf ball drive, or somebody who plays an instrument beautifully? Any of those sorts of things count. Okay, it looks like I dropped out my connection, but I'm back now. John, can you hear me if I get a thumbs up? Okay, good. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay, coaching volleyball, that's awesome. And, and I'm told here by Mark that Reese can crush a golf ball. Is that true, Reese? Are you a golfer? Uh, I'm a golfer. I can't crush it anymore, but... Oh. <laughs> so can I pick on and, you a little and, bit and when it some, comes to golf? Is that cases, okay? And when it comes to Reese, some cases, golf, whether he's a golfer or not, is a relative term. Just want to say. <laughs> so Reese, tell me, uh, tell me, uh, how'd you get good at golf? You may, you may not think you're good at golf, but I guarantee you're better than me. <laughs> As a high schooler, I started. Uh, working at the driving range, picking up range balls on the driving range. The old school way with a football helmet and two shag bags. That was my first job. <laughs> oh, that's great. And then I just tried to practice as much as I could after that. I play not as much as I sh want to and probably more than I should. That's my, probably my, my goal. Yeah. But you kind of said it right there, right? I mean, Really, it just comes down to practice. I mean, that's what skills are about, is practice. Um, really, anything that you guys are good at, um, you've gotten good at through practice. And that's true even for the, some of the softer skills that you mentioned, like uh, communication. Um, you know, it's not actually usually the case that people are naturally gifted communicators. We sometimes think they are. But the reality is those people who are very talented communicators, they've honed that skill day after day, moment after moment. And so skills are refined through practice. And why are we talking about this in the context of ethics? Well, the most common misconception that I see out there is that ethics is, is, is just about good character. That, that people are either good or bad, they're either ethical or not. And, uh, that the job of leaders is to sort of minimize the damage that bad apples can do and to hire as many good apples as you can get. Um, the reason we know this isn't true is from research. There's a ton of research that shows that pretty good people, uh, you know, people that we, that, that uh, we would trust, people that we consider wise and thoughtful, that good people can make ethical mistakes. And there's a danger there, right? It, 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 that uh, if you can be a good person and still make ethical mistakes, then, then how do we deal with this? Well, the answer, of course, take, kind of takes us back to this wilderness idea. But just like wandering through the wilderness is not about good character, like my friend taking his, his group of friends through a, a, a minefield. Ethics is a skill. It's not just about character. I mean, sure, you have to want to be a good person, but that's not enough. You actually need to hone and develop and refine this skill of ethics over time. And as you do hone and, and refine it, then you're better able to handle harder ethical dilemmas as they arise. So if we go back to the original prompt I gave you, um, where you've just retired, um, and you, you're imagining the local paper reflecting on your career and it highlights four things. What do you hope it says? I want you to think about what those things are. In fact, again, I'd like you to make comments in the chat if you could. What are, maybe pick one of the things that you'd want this, this newspaper article to say about your career. Maybe if you could share those in the chat, that'd be great. So take a moment to type in one of the things that you hope could be said about you at the end of your career.
John, John Park, I like that you said that uh, you want to be known for being kind to everyone. And I like that you added to everyone. It's easy to be kind to the people we like, <laughs> but I think that's great. Lena says uh, being respected. I love that. Matthew says being committed to serving the public and improving the quality of life of others. It's a great mission statement, Matthew. Tamara says that you did the right thing for the right reasons. Again, critical refinement there. Steve, that you really cared about the people you worked with and for. Rod, that you developed others. Um, I think that's fantastic. Reese, that you're honest. Man, that's so critical. That, that relationship of honesty and trustworthiness is essential to our careers. Mark also said honest, but also sympathetic. I think that's great. These are great answers, everybody. These are who, these reflect the people we aspire to be. And, uh, you know, in the day-to-day -day grind, it's sometimes it's easy to forget that. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. But our aspirations are, uh, are noble. Um, Rod, I like what you said about how Reese is honest. That's a great example right here, right? Is that that relationship is aligning. That, sorry, that, uh, that reputation is aligning with his aspirations there. I think that's great. These are great answers, everybody. So I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. What you hope that that newspaper article says is going to be based on the stories that people know about you. Think about that. Like whatever goes into this newspaper article that's written at the end of your career is gonna be driven by the stories that people know about you. What they believe about you comes from the stories they know about you. And those stories are those day-to-day -day moments. They're those moments when in a tough situation, you made a hard choice, but the right choice and the result of that right choice um, was an opportunity for you to demonstrate integrity and to build up trust. Mm. These day-to-day -day moments are critical for us. So one of the ways that these stories have a special power is in the face of dilemmas. Nobody ever got a reputation for being ethical if they didn't at times have to make a hard decision. A reputation for ethics doesn't come the easy way, it comes the hard way. And, and the hard way is usually in the face of dilemmas. Ethical dilemmas are where the rubber meets the road when it comes to being, to having integrity and to being a good person. And it's good for us to talk a little bit about dilemmas and how they work. Um, this, is this a dilemma? No, of course not. I mean, this isn't a dilemma. This isn't hard. The answer to should I steal is no, you shouldn't steal. We don't think of this as a dilemma, but this is how a lot of people think about ethics. They think of it as purely about right and wrong. And you got to always choose the right. That is not how the how the world of how, how sort of the reality of ethics works in people's careers. Is something closer to this? Should I steal to feed my family? Is this a dilemma? Well, it is. And let's think about what makes it a dilemma. The thing that makes this a dilemma is that the question of should I steal is still on the table but now it's conflicting with another priority. Stealing is wrong and everybody knows that, but what if stealing is being done for some urgent purpose, for some other higher value? A dilemma when we confront it is values and conflict. When we, the reason ethical dilemmas are hard is because they embed things that we care about that are now in conflict with each other. And if you think about the dilemmas that you've faced, this is true for them. On the one end, there were things that were important to you. And then on the other, there were, there were also things that were important to you, things that were valuable and good and right. But, but because of the circumstances, those things had now come in conflict. I'll give you an example of a very common dilemma that's faced by managers. And it's the dilemma of mercy, where you're in a situation where somebody who works for you has screwed up in some way and now you have to decide how much mercy to extend to that person in the role and in the mistake that they made, recognizing that there are conflicting values here, right? You, you care about that person, you want them to do well, you want them to learn from this and to grow professionally. But on the other hand, the mistake that they made probably cost the organization, maybe cost um, the stakeholders involved. And there are real costs when people screw up at work. And it's important to account for those 
and to make sure that you have a culture of accountability for those kinds of problems. And so this is an example of a very common dilemma. We know this again from our research that it's a common dilemma for people in leadership. This dilemma of mercy and showing mercy and knowing how to balance these conflicting values. The word dilemma even embeds this idea. It comes from the Greek meaning two or, 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 uh, or twice premises or principles, implying that these two principles or premises are in conflict with each other. And I keep telling you that we know this from our research. I'll tell you quickly about the book that my co-authors and I researched and wrote. Uh, it's called the Business Ethics Field Guide. And what we did is we collected five years of research uh, five, we collected dilemmas, I should say, over a five-year period from, from hundreds of people. And these were real ethical dilemmas that people faced in work from dozens of different industries. And so what we did is we went through these hundreds of ethical dilemmas and we identified the most common dilemma categories that people face. Um, and so the book is, is recommends strategies, pitfalls to avoid, questions to ask, that sort of thing. Um, but what we found is that there are 13 common categories of dilemmas that people face at work. So, for example, the most common, I said that, that, that leaders or managers, the most common dilemma they face is, is showing mercy. Well, for those of you who are at the beginning of your careers, the most common dilemma you're likely to face is that someone in power is asking you to do something unethical, like a boss. Uh, but there are a bunch of others here. Uh, you may have found yourself in a situation where you made a promise that's now very hard to keep because the world has changed in some way that's made that promise hard to keep. I think that's probably especially true in the, in the, in the, here in the age of COVID where the world is very different now than it used to be. And the promises that you made before well intended are now much harder to keep because of, uh, because of the pandemic. You may be seeing something that's going wrong elsewhere and find yourself in a situation, do I intervene or not? Uh, conflicts of interest are obviously incredibly common. That's especially true in local government um, where there's a higher responsibility to the public, which heightens the likelihood that you'll experience a conflict of interest. Um, I won't go through all 13 of these, but I just wanna emphasize that what you'll notice in these 13 categories is that the responses are gonna be different to each of these dilemma types. The right way to approach it is not going to be just, am I a good person? And do I know, and, and is that going to guide me through? That's not always going to work. Being a good person, again, is an essential sort of baseline. But on top of that, you need skills, especially when there's so many different kinds of dilemmas that you need to navigate during your career. And I know people who can, who can, who can articulate dilemmas that they face in these categories for all 13 of them. Like, you know, by the end of their career, they have faced and dealt with all 13 of these dilemma categories. So in the spirit of this, let's, let's learn and practice some essential skills together, some essential ethical skills, skills that will help you get better at uh, making ethical choices and managing ethical dilemmas. So the first skill we're gonna practice together is this idea of mastering your values. Um, it is actually very common for people to not really deeply understand and have the values mastered that are essential to them making good choices. Let's stop for a second here because we're gonna do an exercise where I'm gonna ask you to think about your values. And I wanna make sure it's clear what I mean when I say a value. Um, for those of you who took an ethics class in your, at, you know, in your college days, it may or may not have been philosophy heavy. Um, that's you know, where a lot of ethical thought comes from is from philosophy. And I'm not gonna take a philosophical definition for what's a value. Instead, I'm gonna define it really simply. When you think about values, I want you to think, what is it that matters to you? Uh, odds are that's a pretty long list, actually. Another way to think of values is that a value is something that tells you what you should do, right? If it's something you value, it, it somehow is telling you that there's an action you should or shouldn't take as a result of that value. Um, for example, the relationships we have are part of the things we value. And the relationships we have tell us what we should or should not do. And that's what makes them values. So we're going to do a little exercise here. If you have a piece of paper handy, uh, pull it out. Um, you can un use your device or whatever. But I'm going to give you a task here in just a minute to, to write some things down. So I, here's what I'd like you to do. I want to think about this definition of values, things that matter to you, um, 
things that tell you what you should do. I want you to write three values that matter to you. Take a moment to write those down. Okay, hopefully that was enough time. That should have been relatively easy, right? So hopefully it's not too hard for you to do it again. So I want you to write down three more values now. So not the original three that you wrote, but I want you to write down three additional values. Okay, hopefully that was enough time to get down those additional three values. I'm gonna have you do it again. <laughs> so now I want you to write down three more values, not the previous six. These have to be three new values that you have already written down. Okay, well, if you're like most people, that started to get a little bit harder when you got to the, to the, to the second set or especially the third set. Uh, for whatever reason, it can be a challenge to, to do that. Was that hard? I'm curious, and, uh, and why or why not? I, I've got John and Reese with me. You guys can, can interact here. What happens when you start to get beyond just the first three values as you're trying to think of them and write them down? I, well, I've, uh, the first three just were bang, bang, bang. It, it was very easy. And, uh, and when I, when I got to the second three, it was a little, it was a little, uh, more difficult and this fear kind of took over because I, I could see another area on your little sheet. <laughs> I was going to ask for three more and I was trying to get through there and, uh, yeah. it was a little difficult. Got, got to be more difficult. I, I imagine if you spend some time on it uh you know some of those you put down might take a, a, a back seat and it would probably be easier but to just think through that it was uh it was difficult and as you know rod man just said in the uh in the chat box you know they were they were really kind of interconnected they got to be even more interconnected so yeah yeah thanks john i think that's a good description and, and these comments are great too that there's when we start to get beyond the first few, it, we kind of start saying the same thing over again, just with a different lens or perspective. Um, and, uh, and, and like Nina said, it is hard to think of all the things that you're supposed to be or, or want to be. Um, and it does, it feels kind of overwhelming at some point. It can feel overwhelming to think that through. Here's the scary part though. I mean, if you think about it, when we're making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, these values are bouncing around in our heads constantly. Sometimes not even like in a way that's brought to our awareness. But, but every decision you make, every decision we all make is value driven. Every decision is, you make is driven by some value in, or another. And sometimes those values are admirable, right? Like the, the desire to be an honest person and so you 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 tell somebody a hard truth because you think you know I, I want to be honest and this is important, but sometimes the values that guide our decision making aren't aren't always noble. Maybe we do it because we're about to be embarrassed if we act differently, and so we don't like being embarrassed. That's a value driven decision, right? Um, we we make all of our decisions are value driven, and we're often not very clear about the values that are driving our decision-making. And, and being better at, at, the, at knowing what those values are, that's a skill. And so have this list again, if you would, and I want you to take some time to dig deeper into the values that matter to you. And so pick three of the nine values, if you got to nine before our time was up, pick three of the values that are most important to you. You can star those 
um, odds are there are three on that list that tend to rise to the top if you if you rank them in in, in priority. And then we're going to do another exercise again with those values. What I'd like you to do, and I'll just give you some time to to really process this, is I'd like you to think back on what is the story of how these values became important to you. So if honesty is an important value to you, like Reese talked about, you know, Reese, what I'd like you to think about is where did, why did honesty become important to you as a value? Where did that come from? It wasn't, you know, I mean, it, there was, it, it may have happened gradually. It may have happened all of a sudden in a moment, the an example that somebody said, it could have been a lot of different things. But I'd like all of you to think about it with those three values that you chose is why and how do these values become important to you? So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself here for just a minute or two so you can really think deeply on where those values have come from for you. Okay, everybody, hopefully that was enough time for you to, to spend some time thinking about that. Uh, you may find that it's worth your time to revisit this later. If I could, I'd like to share a, a personal story about a value that matters to me. Um, when I was uh, a teenager, so I had just graduated from high school and uh, I, I, grew, I spent most of my growing up in Montana. And up in Montana, we had some property that we were doing work on. Um, it was, you know, pretty dirty, hard work every day. And it took a couple of months to do all the work that we wanted to do, planting trees, moving, moving ground, that kind of stuff. And um, every day at the end of work, I'd, 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 I'd get home and I would um, go, go in, take a shower, eat some dinner, and just sit and watch the TV, right? <laughs> then I'd do it again the next day. Most days my dad was working with me side by side. And, uh, and um, what I didn't notice is at the end of each day of work, he wasn't around in the evenings. Um, it wasn't until about a month or two later that I found out what was going on. There was another family in our neighborhood that was down the street from us. And this was pretty, I mean, when I say neighborhood, like, you know, the homes are pretty far apart in this, where we were living, but, um, there was a family down the road from us that had um, a daughter who had cancer and the family, the whole family had decided to move down to Utah to be a primary children's for her cancer treatment. 
Now this family relied really heavily on their garden every year. They planted a huge vegetable garden that fed them during the summer months, but also they would can a lot and then eat a lot of the, the fruits of their garden in the, in the winter time. And because of the timing of the way this worked out with their daughter, they weren't around to plant and uh, cultivate their garden. And I came to find out that even though my dad, who's you know decades older than me and in worse shape than me, um, was working side by side with me most of these days, at the end of every day, when I was inside vegging out in front of the television, he was actually over at this neighbor's house, planting and watering and weeding their garden. And he was doing this without telling anybody. He didn't even tell me, his son. Um, but, uh, you know, when I found out that this is what was happening, you know, it, it uh, was a really powerful learning experience for me. And so one of the ways I like to describe who my dad was is, you know, among his various strengths and weaknesses, one thing my dad was really good at was being a friend to the friendless. He was somebody who was a friend to people that didn't have friends. Um, and uh, that's an attribute of his that I really deeply admire and is a value for me now. And so, I went, and so when I see somebody who's being excluded, when I see somebody who, you know, maybe isn't uh, connected with other people, my heart is drawn out to them a lot because of the experience of seeing my dad be that way. So I share this story because this is where our values usually come from, our experiences like this. And it's not always one sort of prominent experience like I described with my dad. Sometimes it's the accumulation of experiences over our lives. But it's important for us to reflect on these experiences and where they come from because this, this is how our character is shaped and this is how our skills are developed. Think about how your values have shaped your life. Think about all the different ways that they've influenced who you are. Ask yourself, for example, is there a time when you use values to make a hard decision? Well, the answer is, of course, you use values at the time. But did you, do the, did, did you use the right values is the question to make the hard decision. That's, that's the thing to really be thinking about. Um, so I've been teaching business ethics at BYU um, for uh, almost 15 years now. And for all of that time, I've assigned, I've given my students an assignment called the Personal Code of Ethics. And what I tell them is that they have to, on just one page of paper, write down sort of their personal commitment to ethics and the ethical values that they hold to. Now, it's always kind of funny because when I give these, when I give this assignment to my students at the beginning of the semester, they all, they, they usually say, well, can we see an example of a code of ethics that got a good grade? Which, to be honest, is kind of missing the point, right? And so I tell them, no, no, I'm not giving you a template. I'm not giving you an example to follow. I've just got some really simple instructions here. They get to do multiple drafts of it during the semester so they don't stress out too much about the grade. And it's not like it, it's their entire grade. It's just part of their grade for the class. But one of the most common complaints I get with from students at the beginning of the semester is they feel like the assignment is ambiguous, right? Students hate ambiguity. And so when you give them an assignment that feels ambiguous, they get really uncomfortable with it because they know the ambiguity might catch them and then they end up with a bad grade. And I like to point this out to them. I like to say, look, if you feel like this assignment is ambiguous, the ambiguity is not with the assignment, but it's probably with your ethics. If I'm asking you to write down your personal ethics and you think that that's too ambiguous for me to ask you to do that, <laughs> the problem is probably not with the assignment. It's that you don't fully understand the ethical values that guide you. You haven't really sit down and process that. Now, in their defense, almost nobody has done this. Very few people have actually sat down to say, what are my personal ethical values? What are the things that should guide me as I'm making decisions? And because most people don't think of this uh, and don't take the time to do this, well, the result is their ethical values tend to be blurry in their heads. And they have some idea, right? They can say they want to be honest, but they may, maybe haven't thought about what that means to be honest. They might say that they want to have high integrity, but again, they don't always know exactly what that means. And there's value in taking the time to build this tool for yourself. And I'd encourage you to do it because this is a skill. If you really deeply understand your personal code of ethics, then you will make better choices as a result. So I keep a personal code of ethics. I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't, I guess, with my students. 
And I'll share with you just one of the values that's important to me when it comes to my personal ethics. And this comes out of having been a lawyer in the past, I'm now a recovering lawyer, but uh, having been a lawyer in the past, um, you know, one of the things that, that I realize is really important for me ethically is that when my responsibility is to protect the rights of somebody else, then I need justice to be my guide. My goal has to be fairness. But if my personal rights are at stake, if something that matters to me is at stake, then I should let mercy be my guide. I should find ways to be merciful. When it's my mercy to give, I should be generous with that, with that mercy. That, that thought didn't come all at once. That was something that I kind of refined over time to better understand. And it's helped me make decisions all the time. So when I'm in a position of having to protect somebody else's interests, fairness has to be my guide. I've got to think about what creates a fair outcome. But if it's me, if somebody, you know, you know, is in a situation where they've taken advantage of me or, or maybe in a situation where they're asking for a favor that they, you know, don't exactly deserve because of loyalty or anything like that. In those situations, I try to use mercy to help me make that decision, to help me figure out the way to manage it. And so that distinction has been a useful tool for me. And I won't go into the rest of my personal code of ethics, but I do maintain it and I do update it. And it does serve me. And I do think it's a skill to have this refined personal code of ethics. And I encourage you to think about taking the time to do that. You can even just start now doing this presentation. You can just take the time to sort of, we've already done the, the exercise where you've listed your values. Pick some of those and set a goal to yourself to kind of refine those a little bit. You could even write them out and bounce them off of other people. I've had students who worked hard on their code of ethics during the semester and at the end of the semester, they actually take it and they frame it and they keep it handy in their office as a guide for them. And, uh, and I've had students who have told me that, you know, they relied on their code of ethics in the middle of a tricky dilemma and, and that code of ethics helped them navigate it better. Okay, so we're done talking about mastering values. As you can see, there's so much more to really understanding our values and using them for good decisions um, than I think we realize when we just look at the surface of this. And so I hope you, after this, can find, find some time to dig deeper into your values that guide you and uh, figure out ways to put them to work more often. Okay, so let's talk about, the, I promised you two skills, and we're gonna talk about this second skill now. And uh, this second skill is about creativity. I wanna pause and I wanna tell you guys a story. So um, I have a friend who's a really incredible woodworker, a guy named Richard Wilson. Um, uh, you may be familiar, he's got a business here in Provo, if you've been in Provo. Um, he's got a, a, a jewelry business called Wilson Diamonds. He sold it, so he doesn't own it anymore, but it still is named after him. Uh, Richard is a, a regular speaker in my ethics classes. Um, I like to use him because he has some great stories about the ethical challenges of being a small business owner. Um, but the reason I'm telling this story about Richard right now is because um, uh, is because he's a great woodworker. <laughs> now I know you're wondering what that has to do with ethics, but I'll explain in a minute. But, you know, Richard is such a talented woodworker. I remember one time I took a project over to his wood shop. He's got a great shop set up in, in, in sort of a side building behind his house. And uh, Richard, uh, and so I, I occasionally would take projects to him to get, to get his help. And one time I was there at his, at his shop and there was this incredible table that he had built that was made to go behind the couch in his family room. And this table was so intricate and detailed. I mean, it was immaculate and all the joints he had used were especially beautiful. And, and, uh, and, and it was like, the surface was smooth as glass. I mean, this thing was immaculate. And, you know, you can't do something like that quickly. It had taken him about a year, but it was something he had done as a, as a birthday present for his wife. So it was this really beautiful labor of love that he had produced for her. Um, you know, I want you to think, I want you to imagine what that table might look like. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question. It's going to sound like a weird one, but uh, was that the right table? I mean, think about it. Like, like was that the right table? It's a weird question because that's not the way we think about tables, right? I mean, when we think about tables, we don't think about whether or not they're right or not. We just think about 
other things. Like we think, are they well built? Are they um, beautiful? Uh, are they fit for the purpose, right? Are we using the right kind of table for the right kind of need? Um, you know, we don't think about tables in terms of right or wrong, we don't. And, uh, and I think, but, but that's how we think about ethical choices. We think about ethics as there is a right choice and a wrong choice. And that is not true for the ethical dilemmas we face on a regular basis. The reality is that for every ethical dilemma, there are multiple good choices and there are multiple bad choices. There are lots of ways we can do it right and there are lots of ways we can screw up. And the, the reason this matters is because when we get into this idea of either or, when we get into this false dichotomy of choice A or choice B when we face dilemmas, we end up making worse decisions as a result. And this isn't just me speculating, this is actually true based on research. So some Harvard business professors who um, do really like fantastic research on ethics, they did this incredibly cool study. It took about eight years um, and they tested it in multiple conditions. But the essence of, it, of the study was this. They put people into a dilemma and they told some people, and after giving the some of the people the dilemma, they said, what should the person in this dilemma do? But then to the other group of respondents who read the exact same dilemma, they instead asked those people, what could this person do? And they tested this, like I said, in multiple conditions with multiple different groups of people. <clears throat> and what they found is that when people were prompted with a could prompt instead of a should prompt, the people who had the could prompt came up with more solutions and better solutions in the face of an ethical dilemma. And this, is, this, this testing was reliable across different dilemmas too, not just the same dilemma across all the different ways they studied it. This is a really powerful insight, everybody. I mean, when you think about it, most people, when they face a dilemma, they ask themselves, what should I do? But the, but the real power comes in with, if instead of asking yourself, what should I do? You ask yourself, what could I do? Let me illustrate like different ways, the, the ways that these two phrases get us to think differently. If we use could, we want to come up with a right answer. If we use should, our instinct is to come up with the right answer, which means you've only got one choice that can be right. Um, could is a much more expansive way of thinking. You kind of explore options if you think could, when you think should, you're narrowing your options. You're sort of eliminating things that are possible outcomes. When you think could, you end up focusing more on the outcomes of your choice, like what are the consequences of my choice? Whereas when you're thinking should, you're more focused on your constraints. You're focused on the things that are limiting your options. Could is obviously a much more innovative way of thinking when it comes to ethics, as opposed to should being more conventional. Could is focused more on the social benefit to the people around you, whereas should is more focused on the social pressure. And could is future oriented. You're thinking of what life would be like after the dilemma. But should is past oriented. You're thinking of what life was like before the dilemma. In fact, some of you, and this is a very common reaction, when you confront a dilemma, you wish you could rewind the clock so you could avoid the dilemma, right? You, like your, your preference is to go back in time rather than wrestling with the dilemma you have in front of you and solving the problem. You just wish, man, I wish this had just never happened. And that's because, and it's often driven by should thinking. And so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a moment to think about it, a current decision or dilemma that you're facing. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an ethical dilemma. But uh, maybe think of a situation you're dealing with at work. We have lots of dilemmas right now with uh, COVID, especially in, in government. Um, it's creating all kinds of challenges that, that we have not faced in a long, long time. And so think about this, whatever dilemma you're facing. Um, and I want you to try to solve it with a should mindset. So think to yourself, okay, what should I do in this situation? And take a moment to write down some of those thoughts about what you should do in this in, in the dilemma or decision that you're facing
Okay, now that you've done that, let's change the lens. Let's think about it differently. Take some time to think about it from a could mindset. Think about what you could do in this situation. And I will say this, there are gonna be things you write down that you shouldn't do. <laughs> That's okay. But I want you to be writing down just could. I want you to just be expansive in the way you approach this. Write down lots of different approaches you can take to the problem or decision that you're dealing with. So take some time to write down a bunch of ideas, taking a could mindset. Okay, hopefully that was enough time for you. Um, if some of you came up with new ideas, uh, you don't need to go into too much detail, but maybe you could uh, write down in the chat um, sort of how it helps you think about the problem differently using a could mindset instead of a should mindset. Um, I do wanna point out Rod made this great comment um, as we were working on the exercise. He said another benefit to could versus should is that you're less likely to be critical of a decision that wasn't your preference, right? Because a lot of decisions we make are group decisions, and so we don't have total control over the outcome. And if we get a should mindset about an outcome, like we said, that's a very narrowing approach to take. And the result is it might cause conflict or frustration with the decision the group is making. A could mindset can be more expansive. And it actually, kind of, kind of building on what Rod was saying, a could mindset might help you take where the group is leaning and then add to it or adapt it or amend it in a way that also helps you accomplish what's important to you. But any other thoughts you have about this idea of a could versus, yeah, John, please. But ultimately, Aaron, isn't it a, a should decision? I mean, do you, do you go through, you know, things you could do, but eventually you have to make a final decision. And how does that relate to should versus could? Yeah, I think what in the end what you're doing is you're going to pick your best option, right? I mean, that's that's what dilemmas are when we, when it comes down to it. When we're dealing with dilemmas, we have these values that are conflicting with each other. Taking a should mindset to the dilemma we face means we don't have enough options to choose from. Taking a could mindset helps us think more expansively. Ultimately, we're going to still make a decision. We're not going to do all the things that we wrote down in our list. We're going to pick the best one. And, and you could say that, well, that's a should mindset, but that's not how you got there, right? You got that through a could approach and then eventually you choose the best one. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so Rod, you said with the should, you came up with a binary choice, which is very common, it's how it works. Do something or not do something. But you got six choices in just that limited amount of time. That's awesome by using a could mindset. It really does expand it for us. And often even when we do that initial brainstorming with a could mindset, we don't necessarily choose any of those six. We might actually choose a blend of them, right? We'll pick sort of the best attributes of the different options that we came up with. I think part of the reason we don't do this with ethics, I'll say this, is because ethics has a moral weight to it. I mean, there's, there's, there's something more important about our ethical dilemmas than just our typical run of the mill dilemmas. And so we feel like it has to be treated in a special way. And that is true. But the problem is, is, is it can, that, that approach can cause us to take a more narrow perspective in the short term. And so being creative in our approach to ethical dilemmas can solve them in ways that we never would have expected. Any other thoughts or feedback? Anybody have any other comments? 
Oh, <laughs> Rod, you can have them watch this presentation. That's totally fine. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, I, I guess the league is going to be the one sharing this recording or not. But uh, yeah, I think that's 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 a creative idea. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. So uh, we're going to wrap up now because I've only got about 14 minutes left. I want to talk about leadership um, because this isn't just about ethics. This is about ethical leadership. I do want to emphasize a point, though. We talked about two skills. We talked about mastering values and we talked about uh, getting creative. I don't want you to think about these only as skills for yourself. I want you to think about these as skills for the people that you're managing or leading. How can you help others that you work with or that work for you better master their values? For example, you could do a group exercise where you sit down as a group and say, hey, what are the values that should be guiding us as a team? You know, some, it's, it's actually quite surprising how many companies don't have corporate values, or if they do have them, they sort of never refer to them or think about them. Really sound organizational values can, um, can have a deep and powerful effect on the culture of an organization. So mastering values can be one of the things that you translate into your leadership, not just into your personal decision making. And the same is true for creativity. And we only kind of scratch the surface of the skill of creativity when it comes to ethics. Uh, there's a lot more for us to talk about, but uh, um, but but this but this idea of a could versus should mindset. You could imagine how a leader would coach somebody in a decision that they're wrestling with by using by saying, "Hey, let's let's stop thinking about should for a minute. Let's let's think about could. What are some ways that you could deal with this?" So, thoughts or comments about any of that? I just want to make sure you guys are thinking about this as leaders, not just as users of these skills. Okay, so let's talk about leadership. Um, I want to tell you guys two stories uh, from Pennsylvania. Oh, sorry, I have a question from Matthew. Do you have some suggestions on an organization can utilize the field guide better to understand ethics within your organizations? Um, so the field guide is a great resource. We designed it to be a desk reference. And so I think one of the best things you can do is make it available to people. Um, you might have some copies already from maybe another training that, that you participate in with this or, or somewhere. Um, a lot of people keep their copies on a shelf or in their desk. I'd recommend you keep one out for people to, for, to browse through and flip through. We designed the field guide to be a quick reference guide. It's not, I mean, it's a book that people read cover to cover, but we also want it to be a book that people just turn to in, in, in a situation where they're dealing with a dilemma. You could very easily go to the, ch to the, to the to the table of contents if you're dealing with a dilemma and scan through. I've also uh, known organizations and people who integrate the, the field guide into their um, sort of team meetings. And so they'll read the opening dilemma in the chapter and they'll discuss it together and then they'll maybe cover a few of the strategies that the chapter describes. And doing this on a regular basis, and you don't need to do this like every week or anything like that. I, I mean, you know, it could be monthly or quarterly even. Um, but just having people sort of practice on a dilemma together is a really great exercise. It's actually something we do with Merit Leadership is a program we call Exercising Ethics, where we help organizations create practice opportunities for dealing with dilemmas for their people. Um, because if it's a skill, it's got to be practice. And so you need to find opportunities to practice. Um, Rod just suggested Innovator's DNA is a great book on creativity. I absolutely agree. I'm partial to it in part because it was produced by some talented BYU people, <laughs> but it, uh, it is a really great book on sort of the ingredients of, of creativity and how to think more creatively. So thanks for that suggestion, Rod. Good book. Anyway, hopefully that was helpful, Matthew. Any question about the field guide? Um, it really is a book. You don't need to have it, anybody read cover to cover. Uh, and it's, it's written in a way that you can use it for those sorts of exercises or team discussions. So thanks for that question. Okay, um, so, oh, so Bev is asking the names of the books, The Business Ethics Field Guide and The Innovator's DNA are the two. So Jeff Dyer is a good guy, Rod. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, so let's talk uh, these two Pennsylvania stories. Um, one of them is a happy story, one's a sad story. And uh, I'm gonna start with the sad story even though it didn't start out sad. Um, we're going to State College, and uh, many of you, if you're sports fans, may recognize the guy in the glasses and the white shirt here. 
his name is Joe Paterno, and he is the longtime coach of Penn State football team. Now, if you're familiar with Joe Paterno's entire career, you know that there's a sad ending to this that we're going to be getting to. But, uh, you know, Joe Paterno, and I'm not here to try to rehabilitate his reputation. Um, it's instead, it, it, instead, I want to use his, his experiences to tell an important story about ethics and leadership. Because the thing about Joe Paterno is he had a decades long career of being a deeply ethical coach. He was known for being somebody who always followed the rules. And even when the NCAA rules could get really burdensome, he was known as somebody who always followed the rules, who always encouraged his players to do the right thing. He saw his job as a football coach, not only to win games, but also to build character in all of his players. To illustrate this, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. So, this, is, this picture is from early in Joe Paterno's career, and this story is from his second year as head coach. So um, Penn State flew down to Miami, and they beat University of Miami for the first time in a while. This was in 1967. And uh, it was a big upset victory, um, and the team was obviously elated. This was a huge win for him as a coach because, you know, the first year as a head coach, every head coach kind of gets a pass on, on how well the year goes. It's in the second year as coaching that you start to really wonder if this person is going to be any good at the job. And so the stakes were high for Joe Paterno and they beat Miami, which is a big deal. And so the, the whole team was at the Miami airport waiting to fly home to Pennsylvania. And, and, and Joe and one of his assistant coaches were walking through the airport. And they noticed, they kind of peek into the airport bar, and they noticed that two of the players from the team are in the bar having a drink. Now, they were drinking legally, so they weren't drinking underage. Um, so there was nothing illegal about them drinking in the airport, but they were breaking a team rule. There was a team rule that said that, no, that none of the players could drink in public. Now, I know that sounds like a weird rule, but there's some wisdom in it. Um, because when football players drink in public, maybe other people you know, around maybe want to pick a fight or cause problems when alcohol is involved, maybe their judgment is impaired. And so essentially the idea was don't drink in public because it avoids potential scenes or scandals or other problems. Uh, avoids fights, people that might try to pick a fight with his players. This was especially true in the Miami airport after having just beat Miami, right? You can imagine why this was, such, why this was a wise rule to, for Joe Paterno to impose. Well, Joe Paterno walks into the, to the bar there and turns to one of his players and he says, hey, this is the first time I've had a problem with you, so you're suspended for a few games. And he turns to the other player and says, this is the second problem I've had with you. You're off the team. And just like that, two players, both starters, by the way, one was suspended from the team and the other was kicked off entirely. So the whole team flies home. And the, and the next Monday morning, Joe Paterno is in his office and the team captains show up. And they say, hey, coach, we've got everybody gathered in the locker room. We want to talk with you. We'd like you to reinstate our two teammates. We know they made a mistake. We know they broke the rules, but we're hoping you could just show a little mercy in this time. It was a mistake that, you know, they won't make again. We, we need you to let them know, or we need you to bring them back to the team. So Coach Paterno sends the captains back to the locker room, and he kind of thinks about what he's going to do. And he goes in there, and this is what he tells his players. A rule that protects us all was broken. The decision I made was the best one for all of us, and I have no choice but to stand with it. If anybody here can't live with it, go right now. Oh, shoot. Okay, I still got you. Okay. Um, if you stay, you do it my way, the right way, living by the rules. If you decide to stay and do it that way, we're going to have a great football team. I'm going to walk out of here right now, and a minute later, I'm coming back in, and whoever is still here, that's who we're going to play with. <laughs> now, I want you to imagine the second year of a head coach, and he basically has drawn a line in the sand with his entire team and said, we're going to do it my way, or you're off the team. He could have ended up with no players. He walked down the hallway, and the way he recounted the story is he's sweating bullets, not sure what's going to happen. But as you might expect, when he walked back into the locker room, every single player stayed in that locker room not a single one left and he set a very high standard that persisted for decades joe paterno said this in a in, a, in an autobiography he said, said he said success is, is perishable and often outside of our control 
In contrast, excellence is something that's lasting, dependable, and largely within our control. Now, we fast forward to the end of Joe Paterno's career, and we get a pretty sad outcome. If you're not familiar with the story, there was a former assistant coach of Penn State, a um, guy named Jerry Sandusky, who had been abusing kids um, sexually for years. He had used the facilities at Penn State um, as a way to accomplish this and part of a summer camp that he had been running. An assistant coach, a current assistant coach of Joe Paterno's essentially caught Jerry Sandusky in the act and reported it to, uh, to Joe Paterno. Joe Paterno took that information and reported it to the athletic director, put it in the university's hands. And then the university sat on that information for a couple of years and did nothing about it. Didn't report Jerry Sandusky to the police, didn't do anything else. And in that time, Jerry Sandusky continued to abuse these young kids. Well, eventually it, the story broke and everybody found out that not only did Penn State know about this behavior and not do anything, but that even Joe Paterno had known about it and didn't do anything other than report it to his boss. Well, Joe Paterno retired, um, probably would have been fired if he hadn't retired. And he actually passed away shortly thereafter. So he didn't have a lot of opportunities to talk. Well, he chose to not take advantage of very many opportunities to talk about this publicly. So we only have a few statements from him. One comes from an interview that he gave to the Washington Post, and this is what he said. He said, we never had, uh, until that point, 58 years, I think, I'd never had to deal with something like that, and I didn't feel adequate, is what he said. He continued in that interview to say, I didn't know exactly how to handle it and was afraid to do something that might jeopardize what the university procedure was. So I backed away and I turned it over to some other people, people that I thought would have had a little more expertise than I did. Well, it didn't work out that way. He also said famously in a public statement, in hindsight, I wish I had done more. You know, we should be really asking ourselves and thinking about ourselves and our own professional careers. If somebody like Joe Paterno could make such a colossal mistake, could we? Especially when you think about this quote from him earlier. Well, I'm going to quickly tell this other story, and this one is from Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh is the home of Alcoa, a huge aluminum manufacturer, and the CEO at the time was a guy named Paul O'Neill. I'll show his picture in a minute. But Paul O'Neill was notorious for prioritizing safety over everything. The first thing he read every morning when he got to work was the safety reports worldwide from the previous day. So we always knew what was happening when it came to the safety of the company. Well, at the shareholders meeting in 1996, a woman showed up, the woman on the right here, her name is Sister Susan Mika, and she's a Benedictine nun. And what she does, and she still does this to this day, is she will own shares in various companies to hold them accountable for worker safety, among other things. And she came to the Alcoa shareholders meeting, took her turn at the microphone and said, hey, why did your company poison several hundred of your employees in their La Ciudad, Mexico plant. And uh, um, uh, Paul O'Neill denied it. He said it didn't happen. If it happened, I would have known about it. And she pushed and what well, he came to realize that it did happen, that the, that the president of the business unit who was in charge had basically covered up those injuries. Well, Paul O'Neill had to decide what to do and he decided to fire this guy. Not only did he fire him, he fired him in the, in the, with, a, with an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And he said it mattered because of what it communicated about these values and how important they were. And this was a hard choice because this person that he fired was also a personal friend. And so he noted that this was an especially painful decision for him. I want you to think about these two stories. What did Joe Paterno lack that Paul O'Neill had? It was about skills. There was a difference in skills. And that's why Joe Paterno made the bad choice, made a wrong choice, whereas Paul O'Neill made a good one. Ethics in the end is a leadership skill. Think about your career and what you want it to be. It's gonna come from the stories that people know about you and the stories that people know about you are gonna be uh, based on the skills that you exhibit on a day-to-day -day basis. So I hope, you can continue to refine those skills. There's hope for us all. I really believe that. None of us is perfect, but all of us can improve. And I hope as leaders, you can cultivate that as well for the people that you're leading. So thanks, everybody. It was really a pleasure to be with you all. 
and I hope we can do it again sometime in person. Well, thank you, Aaron. That was, that was very insightful. A lot of uh, food for thought. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the work you do and uh, the opportunity you take to address this uh, great uh, audience of leaders throughout our uh, communities in the state of Utah. So thank you and thank you all. And uh, we'll see you all at our next session. Thank you.